Um, okay, uh, welcome back, hey, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and this is the Dharma Doors. Um, tonight, we're going to continue our conversation about a number of things. We're going to continue talking about upaya. We are going to continue talking about the bodhisattva and the way of the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva path. We are going to continue reading from our sutra, from the Upaya, the Mahayana Upaya Sutra. Um, and tonight, tonight's going to be fun because I'm going to read a story from the, from the sutra. And it's not actually even a story exactly. It is a parable. It's a kind of a, a very interesting parable. So we're going to have a lot to talk about that. Um, in fact, what I kind of would probably start with is we have concluded one portion of the sutra. We sort of concluded that last week. And so today we actually are going to move on to part two of the sutra. We're going to, it's going to be a kind of a whole new, um, a, a whole new character is introduced and a whole new story. And I actually, before we kind of get to the reading of the story, we have a few things to talk about. But it's actually tonight, this story that we're going to get to, this is actually more of what I remembered when, when I first ta thought, oh, let's let's read this sutra on Sunday night. It was more of these kind of stories that I was remembering from this sutra that I thought would be fun to talk about. Um, we kind of got wrapped into some conversations about a bunch of different things from that first section. Primarily, we got into some tricky conversations about Buddhism and sexuality. And that's a lot of what that first part of the sutra had to deal with. Let's actually kind of slowly start to dive back into that story by reminding us the sutra that we've been reading, a Mahayana sutra, it begins with a bodhisattva named Nyanotada, this uh, superior knowledge, superior wisdom bodhisattva. And at the very beginning of the sutra, it goes to the Buddha and asks about skillful means, upaya. And then the Buddha proceeds to give the bodhisattva a, a kind of a teaching about what upaya is for a bodhisattva. So we spent a little bit of time on that. But then the, the sutra kind of moved into an interesting new mode. It, is, it, it stopped being where the Buddha is just dispensing the wisdom to the bodhisattvas, and it turned into kind of a story or a kind of a, a parable actually multiple parables. And it all started with this monk, Ananda, right? And if you've been coming to Dharma doors or you've read a lot of Buddhist sutras, you know Ananda is always kind of getting into trouble. He's sort of the young monk. He's sort of, um, Ananda is always forever uh, a little wet behind the ears, as they say. And so he sort of always becomes sort of the eh, kind of a scapegoat in that way. So what happens is, is that in this kind of more parable part of the sutra, it all begins when Ananda basically kind of tattletales, he like rats out a bodhisattva, for sitting on the same uh, bed, sitting on a couch with a woman. And basically Ananda, who represents this kind of earlier austere monastic form of Buddhism has a problem with that. And so kind of points the finger at the Bodhisattva. But then the Buddha reveals all of these kind of these backstories about Bodhis the Bodhisattva in question. And then actually even reveals some backstory of his, the Buddha's own past lives in which he too kind of sat on couches with women and all of that. 
And there's even more parables that kind of get, uh, get told in that section. But it all culminates at the end with Ananda, and actually I'll, I'll start reading because this is officially from part two of the sutra. So if you have the yellow book, the treasury of Mahayana sutras, I'm on page 440. I, I'll actually, I wanna tell you in this version, which is a, a translation from the Chinese, they start section two here with Ananda. But I would like you to know that in the other translation of this sutra from the Tibetan, um, this part with Ananda is included more still in part one. And what it is, is, is basically Ananda says, um, uh, basically, I had it all wrong, world honored one. And from now on, I will hold all bodhisattvas in the greatest esteem. Um, and this, so the lesson that Ananda receives is all about the superiority of the bodhisattva because of the unique kind of practice of a bodhisattva. So that kind of concludes part one. And we we pick back up on that idea of the bodhisattva when we kind of move into officially part two. And this is when, after that, the, the, another monk, another representative of that early Buddhist tradition steps up. And this is a monk named Maha Kashapya or Kashapa. Uh, just called Kashapa or Mahakashapa. So Mahakashapya then says to the Buddha, marvelous world honored one, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas are the supreme, most venerable of beings. Bodhisattva Mahasattvas cultivate all the dhyanas and all the samadhis, but after such cultivation, they again enter the realm of desire to teach and convert sentient beings. So let's pause for a minute. I want to tell you a little bit about Kashyapa, this monk who's talking, and then we're going to dive a little deeper into the Bodhisattva path. But first, who is Kashyapa? So we don't hear too much from Kashyapa, at least in the, of the sutras that I've been reading. And I'll kind of tell you a little bit about why that is. There's a certain um, world, actually, even before I tell you about the world of Buddhism, Kashyapa or Kashyapa is, well, he's an interesting figure in the world of Buddhism because in most traditions, mo almost all Buddhist traditions, they actually kind of recognize Kashyapa as like the person who took over after the Buddha died. Now, there's a lot of con controversy about this idea of whether Kashyapa was like put in charge or not. And what happens is, is that as many of you know, there is this kind of famous first council, and it was a, a gathering of followers of the Buddha that happened after he died. And it was a gathering of the so-called 500 arhats or arahats. And it was Kashyapya who ran the first council. Now, at the first council, at this first gathering, it's when a monk named Upali stepped up and said, you know what? I remember all the monastic rules. I remember all the monastic discipline and all the precepts that the Buddha taught us. So Upali, that monk, becomes sort of the head or the chief of the Vinaya. And then... Ananda, and there's a backstory about Ananda that I won't tell you just now, but at the council, Ananda steps up and says, oh, 
I remember all the sutras. I remember, like, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was at this place, and thus have I heard, once the Buddha was at that place. So Ananda becomes sort of the rememberer, or the, like, he's in charge of the sutras. And then it's Shariputra, the famous Shariputra that we're always hearing about, who's the, who steps up and says, oh, I remember all the Abhidharma. I remember all of the Buddha's deeper teachings about the lessons given in the sutras and the Vinaya. So Shariputra represents this sort of um, the tradition of interpretation and the tradition of analysis. It's why Shariputra is always kind of being taught these more technical lessons. So those are the three representatives of the Vinaya, the sutras, and the Abhidharma. But it's interesting to remember that Kashyapa was the chief monk who organized and kind of was the, you know, is like the leader in that way. And even in the lifetime of the Buddha, Kashyapa was the, the leader of the monks. Like he was the one that corralled everybody together. He was the one that sort of was the disciplinarian in that sense. So he has an interesting status within the world of Buddhism as the leader or the chief in that way. Now, that's very standard. Again, almost I'd say all schools of Buddhism recognize Kashyapya as the the organizer of the first council and all of those things. But there's another little side tradition that has to do with Kashyapya that I want to tell you about because it kind of relates to the theme tonight, or at least the theme of Upaya. So what happens is, is that there is a, well, I don't know what you would call it. I would guess you could call it an, an apocryphal tale. So it's a, it's a story about Kashyapya that you won't find in sutras. And what it is, is it's a special story about this monk, Kashyapya, who, well, it was the last teaching of the Buddha right before he died. <laughs> and everybody had gathered around to hear the Buddha's final teaching. And this was going to be like, it this was going to be the big message and so the buddha was in this deep state of meditation and everybody had gathered around from the 10 directions even the devas naksha yakshas gandharavas asuras and all the non-human beings so everybody was there and when the buddha came out of his meditation rather than saying anything he just held up a flower and twisted it in his fingers. And the story is, is that there was one monk, Kashyapya, in the audience who smiled. He saw the flower, he saw the Buddha twist the flower in his fingers, and Kashyapya smiled. And the story is that at that moment, there was a direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma between Shakyamuni Buddha and the monk Kashyapya. And that's how it is that this monk became sort of the, the leader after the Buddha died because the, he was the only one that understood the the silent teaching of the Buddha just twisting the flower in his fingers. Now, the story, if you haven't heard this story, the story is, is that after or right before Kashyapya was about to pass away, he did something similar and, and did a direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma and gave the status of leader to Ananda. And then Ananda, when he was about to die, pulled a student aside and gave him the direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission. And this direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma 
continued in an unbroken line all the way up, they say, through 28, I think, 28 patriarchs in India, ending with a Buddhist monk named Bodhidharma. And it's Bodhidharma, having received this direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission, it's Bodhidharma who takes this tradition by boat through Southeast Asia to Southern China and begins spreading the direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission throughout China. And eventually the direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission goes to Japan. And everything that I'm talking about with this direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission is what has become known as the Zen Buddhist tradition. So most, not all of them, but most schools of Zen Buddhism, what make them Zen is that they believe in this unbroken direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma that goes all the way back to Kashyapya. And in particular, what's of significance about this for us tonight is that this, the sutra where the Buddha just twisted the flower, this is considered an upaya, a skillful means. And so the idea is actually that this subtle gesture that the Buddha made of just showing a flower is this upaya. It's a skillful means that apparently only Kashyapya really understood the depths of. And that's why he continues this sort of chain or this unbroken chain. Now I'm telling you all this again to point out that there's this sort of really interesting intimate relationship between Kashyapya and upaya of like this kind of idea. So that's where Kashyapya comes into this as a, as a, again, as a kind of allegorical figure in that way, not as a historical figure in that sense. And now let me read again what Kashyapya says. So he too is praising the status of a bodhisattva by saying, marvelous world honored one, bodhisattvas are supreme, most venerable of beings. They cultivate all the dhyanas and samadhis, but after such cultivation, they again enter the realm of desire to teach and convert sentient beings. So that's kind of the grand message of this sutra so far. And it has been this, well, what we've been reading so far has been about the bodhisattva's relationship to what have been called the five sensual pleasures. So seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, eating things, touching things, and that idea of the five sensual pleasures. And what we've heard is that the bodhisattva sort of uses the five sensual pleasures, like partakes, participates in the five sensual pleasures, but does so as an upaya in order to help people out or to fulfill their vow of awakening all sentient beings. So Kashyapya puts that in a kind of specific way of this idea that a bodhisattva develops all these dhyanas and samadhis and yet still <clears throat> comes back into the realm of desire. The thing about that is within the world of old school, original Buddhism that Kashyapya kind of represents, in that old school form of Buddhism, once you got out of the realm of desire, <laughs> you didn't want to go back into the realm of desire. There, there, there was no, um, that did not compute in the early Buddhist tradition. Now, I want to remind you, if you don't know this teaching, it's a pretty broad general teaching, but 
you know, the, it's a general Buddhist view of the world here that we live in, that there's sort of like three dimensions to this reality here. There's the realm of desire, which is literally that, the realm of these things and the way in which we want them or the way in which we don't want them or the way in which we're mad at them. But the realm of desire is this overlaying of our desires and wants and not wants, like this overlaying of that onto a kind of reality. And through meditation and calming the mind, you can transcend that realm of desire. And then as we've spoken about many times in Dharma doors, then you could abide in just the realm of pure form, which is right here. It's just, it's the realm of things in terms of their basic size, shape, color, number, like the basics. And then you could go even further in the calming of your mind and meditation and get into the formless realm. The, the, the realm of infinite space that's sort of the space in between everything in that way. Now, in original old school Buddhism, the problem was that we were always overlaying the realm of desire, superimposing the realm of desire onto the realm of form. And that was a problem that is a problem for a number of reasons. One of the main reasons is that we project all of this desire onto the world, but forget that we're doing that. And so we get confused when other people can't see things the way that we do, when it's so obvious. Why can't they see that this is good and that's bad? So the realization is, is oh, I'm superimposing a layer of my own desire on this reality. So there are processes and methods to stop doing that. And in early Buddhism, again, if you kind of successfully stopped doing that, meaning you transcended that realm of desire, it again, you wouldn't go back to doing that. You wouldn't go you know, back to entertaining those ideas and all of that. And you would sort of remain, especially if you were an arhat, like somebody who'd really achieved the way, if you were an arhat, you would always basically be in either the realm of pure form or you'd be going into a deep meditative state and getting into the formless realm. But you're not going back to the realm of desire. Here, we're told bodhisattvas are so amazing. <laughs> They're so incredible because they practice these meditation techniques, the dhyanas and the samadhis, they get them out of the realm of desire. And yet they again enter the realm of desire to teach and convert sentient beings. Although they practice the three gateways of liberation, which is they understand emptiness, characteristiclessness, and desirelessness or non-action is the way they translate it here. So although they practice emptiness, characteristiclessness, and desirelessness to convert sentient beings and cause them to become shravakas and prateki buddhas, still, out of great kindness and compassion, they are never apart from the mind of all-knowing wisdom. So, that's a kind of a classic definition of a bodhisattva there, that idea of a normal Buddhist in the old school version is just trying to get themselves out of the realm of desire. <laughs> and once they've done so, they're not going anywhere near the realm of desire again. But out of compassion for sentient beings, the bodhisattva goes back in. And that's this kind of... Um, the hallmark, if you will, or a defining characteristic of a bodhisattva is that willingness to go back in in that way. Okay, any questions about the bodhisattva path or kashapya, Zen Buddhism? Anything I've said up to this point? Cool. Let's hear a parable. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, 
Well, then Kashyapya says world honored one, inconceivable is the upaya of bodhisattvas. So world honored one, and I'm skipping just a little bit, world honored one, with great delight, I will enumerate a few merits of the bodhisattva. And the Buddha said to Kashyapya, you may do as you wish. And now listen carefully. Kashyapya said, world honored one, suppose there is a vast marsh or according to the Tibetan translation, which I prefer, suppose there were a vast wasteland whose inhabitants are afflicted with a grievous famine. Surrounding the wasteland is a wall high enough to reach the realm of formlessness. Leading out of the wasteland in which many sentient, being li many sentient beings live, there is only one gateway out. Not far from the marsh or not far from the wasteland, suppose there's a large city which is rich, happy, prosperous, beautiful, and grand. The sentient beings who enter that city do not suffer from old age, sickness, or death. The only path from the wasteland to that city is a one foot wide path, very straight. Among the people in the wasteland, there is a wise person who suddenly, out of great kindness and compassion, decides to give benefit, peace, and joy to all the sentient beings in the wasteland. They announce loudly in the center of the wasteland, you know, that not far from here, there is a large city where many gods live, which is rich, happy, prosperous, beautiful, and grand. The sentient beings who enter that city will not suffer from old age, sickness, and death, and they will be able to teach others the way to also avoid old age, sickness, and death. You may go there with me. I shall be your guide. In the wasteland, there are lowly and inferior sentient beings who wish to acquire such liberation, but they say, we will accept your teaching if only you can enable us to live here in the wasteland. We will not accept your teaching if you wish us to move from here. The superior sentient beings in the wasteland say, we will go with you to that place. However, after hearing the wise person's words, other sentient beings in the wasteland who are less fortunate do not believe them, and they refuse to follow. World Honored One, when the wise person emerges from the wasteland, they look around and see that narrow path only one foot wide. To the left and right of the path, there are large pits, hundreds of thousands of feet deep. After the wise person fences off both sides of the path with boards, the followers crawl forward without looking left or right. They do not look back even when malicious robbers pursue them and frighten them. Brave and fearless, they proceed gradually along the road. Finally, they see the city, and then they feel assured. After entering the city, they suffer no more old age sickness and death. Furthermore, they can now benefit countless other sentient beings by teaching them the way to avoid old age, sickness, and death. <clears throat> okay, 
So that's our parable. I'm going to read the next part, which is the kind of interpretation of the parable. But I just wanted to pause and kind of let that image sink in for a moment. And I also kind of want to then take a moment to talk a little bit more about Upaya. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that it was this kind of story, this kind of parable that I remembered from this sutra. And it was these kind of parables that I wanted to share with you and I kind of wanted to like talk about. <clears throat> but that parable in particular, the wasteland, the idea of like these people living in this wasteland and there's a city, but it's hard to get to. And there's somebody that's willing to guide people to that city. I want you to know that there's this, you know, very famous sutra called the Lotus Sutra. And there's actually a lot of, um, uh, a lot of parallels between this interesting little Upaya Sutra that we're reading and the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra is kind of considered the sutra about Upaya. Like it's, it's like, if you were to ever kind of ask somebody, uh, you know, where would I learn about Upaya? It would be the Lotus Sutra. Even I would say before the, even the Upaya Sutra that we're reading. This Sutra, if you don't know the Lotus Sutra, it's also kind of, well, it's kind of an anthology in that way where it's a lot of parables put together a lot of little stories. So it's kind of also, again, similar to the sutra that we're reading. But I want you to know that there is a famous part of this sutra, chapter seven, I think it is. Yep. So chapter seven of the sutra is called The Parable of the Phantom City. And basically, I mean, the parable of the Phantom City is a little different but they're basically the same parable or the same story. So I'm mentioning all of this so that if this type of Buddhism kind of um, uh, tickles your fancy in that way, this is a, a great place to go to read more of these kinds of parables. So, okay. So now after hearing uh, this interesting parable from Kashyapya about the wasteland, Let's get an understanding of what he was talking about. World Honored One. The vast wasteland afflicted with a grievous famine is the wasteland of samsara. The thick high wall that reaches all the way up to the realm of formlessness is ignorance and the craving for existence. The many sentient beings in the wasteland stand for all the ordinary people involved in samsara. The only road to that city, the one foot wide path, is the one path. The wise person in the wasteland is a bodhisattva mahasattva. Those lowly and inferior sentient beings who wish to acquire liberation, but they want to remain in the wasteland, those are shravakas and pratekya the, the voice hearers and the solitary enlightened ones. The superior sentient beings who say, We'll go to that place with you, are other bodhisattvas in the wasteland. The unfortunate sentient beings who hear the wise person's words, but don't believe him, are the heterodox masters and all their disciples, all the heretics. Those who escape from the wasteland are those who diligently cultivate the mind of all knowing wisdom. The one foot wide path leading out of the wasteland 
is the gate of the Dharma nature. The huge pits to the left and to the right of the path, which are hundreds of thousands of feet deep, those are the vehicles of the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha. To put up a fence, to fence in both sides of the path with boards, that is the upaya, the skillful means born of wisdom. Those who crawl forward are sentient beings who are attracted to the Buddha Dharma by bodhisattvas who use the four means of unification. The malicious robbers who pursue and frighten those people are the king of demons and his subjects. The sentient beings who stubbornly hold the 62 erroneous views and those who despise and slander bodhisattvas. Those are the malicious robbers and bandits. Not to look back is to be fully absorbed in the paramita of patience, kashanti. To not look to the left or the right is to not be attracted to or to praise the Shravaka vehicle or the Pratekya Bhutta vehicle. The large city that we're trying to get to is the mind of all-knowing wisdom. Those who, having proceeded gradually along the road, finally see that city and feel assured, those are bodhisattvas who, having seen Buddhas and their deeds, respect the Buddha's wisdom and awesome virtue with all of their hearts. They learn well the paramita of wisdom, pranya, and they, are gradually, they gradually acquire the upaya to approach all sentient beings with propriety and without misgivings. Those who suffer no more old age, sickness, and death after entering that city are bodhisattvas who benefit countless sentient beings by teaching them the way to avoid old age, sickness, and death. This way is the Dharma taught by the Tathagatas, the worthy ones, the all-knowing ones, world-honored one. I now pay homage to all the bodhisattvas. And of course, after Mahakashyapya had said this, 10,000 gods and humans generated bodhicitta. Okay, so let's go through some various ideas. Let's start anything come to mind, anything of interest to anybody in the parable, particularly the explanation of the parable? Yeah. Uh, I don't get why the pits are the Protecia Buddhas. Yep. Or like what? Great, great. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> great, great place to start. Um. So yeah, let's talk about that aspect of it. So this is actually a really important part are a really important point. So as all of you know, if you've, been, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know that these sutras, especially these Mahayana sutras, you know that they're always talking about the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas. So once again, if, if you're not familiar with this language, the word Shravaka, is means a voice hearer. It's literally what that word, the etymology of shravacha or shravaka means is to hear voices. But the general understanding of that term, a shravaka, is it was the people who literally heard the Buddha like talk, like heard him teach. So the, the contemporaries of the Buddha. In other words, the group of 
monastics that surrounded the Buddha. Those are the Shravakas. And essentially what the Shravaka is, is a, it, that idea is the representation of the old school form of Buddhism that was only interested in individual enlightenment. None of this bodhisattva business, none of this altruistic caring for sentient beings. No, 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 no. We're in caves, we're in the woods, and we're working on our own liberation. That's a Shravaka. What makes a Shravaka a Shravaka, though, is that idea of the voice hearer. And the idea is, is that a, a voice hearer or a Shravaka is not only, only interested in their own liberation, but they also have a kind of, um, well, they pedestal the Buddha. The Buddha is like the great guru. And so the, uh, I, um, the term shravaka, although it literally means voice hearer and refers to this idea of hearing the voice of the Buddha, there's also a way in which it is interpreted, not translated, but interpreted as a learner, a student. And so the critique of the Shravaka is that they always remain in the position of a student and they never, they never in a way help sentient beings by becoming a teacher in that way. Now, I know that Shariputra and different Shravakas are sometimes teaching the Dharma, but there's a slightly kind of philosophical idea here where their status is always subservient to the Buddha. Meanwhile, there's these Pratekya Buddhas that are off in the, in the woods and they're not studying under the Buddha. They're out there being Buddhas. And what makes a Buddha, a Buddha, generally speaking, is actually a pretty clear, a clearly defined understanding, actually. What makes a Buddha a Buddha is understanding dependent origination. And what goes along with understanding dependent origination is understanding emptiness. Because if you understand that things are dependently originated and not inherently self-originated, meaning like born and created, if you understand dependent origination, then you basically understand emptiness. And the Pratekya Buddha is somebody who has realized emptiness, has realized dependent origination. And in most traditions, they are called a solitary Buddha because they figure this out all by themselves. And within the world of Buddhism, that's totally, totally possible because dependent origination is just what's going on. <laughs> It's just what's happening. And so it's here, it's here to be realized. Now, both the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha are critiqued or sort of put down by the Mahayana, by the Bodhisattva path, because they are both instances of individual enlightenment. Both of them are only interested in liberating themselves. And as I've spoken about in other Dharma Doors classes, there's kind of a philosophical uh, understanding that it's only possible to liberate oneself in the early form of Buddhism that rep are represented by the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha. So what happens is, is that the Mahayana becomes this whole other form of Buddhism based upon the Bodhisattva path. And what makes it the Bodhisattva path, as I've kind of been articulating now for weeks, it's the emphasis on the altruistic vow to liberate all sentient beings. And in fact, to emphasize this point, earlier on, Earlier on in the sutra, there was a discussion of transgression. There was a discussion of transgressing rules and precepts. And what it said, and I'm paraphrasing, it basically said that the worst transgression that a bodhisattva can make 
is to kind of renege or to go back on their vow to liberate all sentient beings. That's like worse than anything they could possibly do is to kind of go back on that vow and effectively just decide to go along either the Shravaka path or the Pratekya Buddha path. Now, I want to talk more about this because I think it's so important to kind of really understand the difference between these. So as a matter of practice, forget the philosophy. I could, I usually do. We could talk about the deeper philosophy of emptiness and all of that. But I really want to focus on, it's sort of about, it's this practice of, like I'm saying, this kind of vow to altruistically work on the behalf of everybody's awakening. And a big part of that vow, like a, a big, big part of the vow is it's really about the equanimity of the vow. And what I mean is it a bodhisattva doesn't say like, I'm going to save all Americans, but forget everybody else. <laughs> like, I'm just going to look out for these people. And, or they don't say, I'm just going to, you know, uh, try to help all the Buddhists. But if you haven't decided to be a Buddhist, if you're a Christian, forget about it. I'm not going to help you in any way. No, no, no. The Bodhisattva, the vow, what makes it the vow is that it's this, no, 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 all sentient beings. And I want to emphasize that point as well, that when the Buddhists talk about all sentient beings, they're talking about all sentient creatures, not just all the people, all beings equally, being concerned about them all equally. And Again, as a practice, something to pay attention to. If, if you are on the bodhisattva path, or if you have thought about like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Something to think about is that when we make this vow, it's, it becomes this practice because it might occur to the bodhisattva <laughs> that it or not occur to them, but it might be that, you know, when my when my friends or my family, when they come and ask me for assistance or help or whatever, I'm, oh, you know, I'll, I'm ready to help. I'm a bodhisattva. I've made the vow to help all sentient beings. So when my family and friends come to me for help, but then somebody on the street that I don't know, they might come to me asking for help. And I, might, I may or may not help them out. And that's what the Bodhisattva needs to analyze is how easy it is actually to be friendly and kind and generous and helpful to our friends and family. But when it's somebody we don't know, and they're just kind of on the street asking me for money or food or something. This is actually when the bodhisattva is put in. That's when we're put into practice then. And actually, it's not even about our friends and family and helping them out. And it's not even about helping out those who we don't know. It's actually about extending loving kindness and compassion to the jerks, to the people that are maybe even not being nice to us. Extending loving compassion even to, again, it's not even even to them. The vow is all sentient beings equally. And again, what the bodhisattva wants to pay attention to is when they close themselves off and they say, no, no, no. I'm not going to extend, that person doesn't deserve my kindness and compassion. That's a mentality that the Bodhisattva wants to pay attention to and really interrogate. Like what's with that attitude, this idea that that person doesn't deserve that kindness. Now, 
what I'm getting to is I'm getting around, this has been a long answer to Noam's question about the pits. <laughs> so the idea here is, is that we are on this very narrow foot wide path <laughs> to the city of all knowledge. And on that path to the city of all knowledge, there's going to be temptation to basically say, you know what? Good luck, everybody. <laughs> like, really good luck. But I got to just look. I just got to look out for me. I, you know, I really wanted to help you all out, but it's either gotten too hard or it seems too impossible or whatever it is. And so I'm just going to go back to looking out for myself. Ah, I've fallen into the pit of a shravaka, right? So, so that's the idea, Noam, is that's where those pits on either side, you know. Um, is that a, a good answer there? Yeah, that was great. That was great. Nice, nice. It's hard, though. How so? Well, it's. I don't know. We talk a lot in Dharma Doors about the 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 difference between the Hinayana and the Mahayana and the and the and you know we've had sort of philosophical discussions of like if someone does go off into a cave and you know spend the rest of their life in uh, you know the formless realm is that okay or not? Like, are they doing anyone any harm? And, and this, this is sort of like, don't do that. You're going, that's like falling into, you know, a pit that's, you know, thousands of meters, <laughs> whatever it was. And, and, and there's been other things like that in this sutra that, that are a little harsh on that early path. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Noam. And this sutra, a sutra like this, really wants you to be a bodhisattva <laughs> they are like that's really what this sutra is all about is really encouraging you to walk that path and not those other two paths in that way um on that on that note gnome, gnome though you know we we have had those great conversations about those who would go off into the woods and sort of just do kind of solo work in that way and you know let's not forget that there is a a long tradition of the forest dwelling bodhisattva and so what i mean to say is is that what we're really looking at what we're really talking about is the compassionate heart that even if they're out in the woods all alone their heart is still extending that wish, that desire for all beings to be liberated of their suffering, to extend that loving kindness and compassion, whether we're engaging with people or not. And then there could also be just somebody out in the woods who is kind of, you know, not like the Unabomber or anything, but just sort of out there brooding and kind yeah. of angry at the world <laughs> and sort of having been like, you know what? Screw it, everybody else. I'll be in the woods getting enlightened. <laughs> That's what this sutra kind of is saying. You know what? You're not actually going to get anywhere doing that. <laughs> it, it might seem like it. You might have a, a really trippy meditation every now and then, but ultimately you're just going to kind of be coming back around in a certain way. So. Speaking of coming back around, let's, uh, I, unless anybody has any other points of the parable that stuck out of interest, let's kind of go through some of the, the points, like the, the way the parable works. Let's start with the main one, which is the wasteland. So again, in the Chinese version, it's a marsh. And in the Tibetan uh, version, it's a wasteland. And I, I like the image of the wasteland. It's a little more uh, desolate in that way. If you've never been to a marsh and you've never like tried to live in a marsh and grow things in a marsh, 
then a marsh might sound like a place you might not want to leave in that way. So a wasteland, though, I feel like we all kind of have a feeling of, yeah, I don't want to live in the wasteland. So let's talk a little bit about samsara. It's, it's a topic we've talked about a few times, like in detail, but let's sort of discuss it in regards to this um, parable. So this is, by the way, this is what I mean by the, um, the relationship to the Lotus Sutra, in particular, the Phantom City, Chapter 7. That story is also about a bunch of people living in a desolate place and a caravan leader who is going to guide these people out of that desolate place. And actually, I'll paraphrase it for you, but what's interesting about that is the parable in the Lotus Sutra is actually about how everybody's trapped in samsara and the guide, who's the Buddha or a bodhisattva, but in that it's the Buddha, the guide is going to take us all out of samsara. But about kind of midway on the journey out, everybody starts to get a little tired of getting out of samsara. It gets a little bit too much. And so the guide says, whoa, 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 whoa. but don't, don't give up just yet. Right over there, there's a, a, a city. And so he, the guide creates this magical city and basically says, yeah, it's a nice place where we can rest. It's uh, It's got these like swimming pools and jacuzzis and all of this. Like, you'll love it. Come on, come on. And so everybody puts forth a little bit extra effort so they can get to the Phantom City. And then when everybody's rested, the Buddha has a hard time because he's got to say, okay, everybody, now let's, we, we got we to go. This was just a resting place. And in that, in the Lotus Sutra, the Phantom City is actually Nirvana. It's this idea that in order to get us all out of samsara, the Buddha tricked us all with this idea of nirvana. But ultimately, we don't, we don't want to stop in nirvana either. But that's just an upaya of the Buddha in that way. This parable doesn't quite go that, that place. It just sets up this, um, I suppose you would say a paradigm, but it just sets up this situation where we're in the wasteland of samsara. There's a very narrow path that gets us out to this city where everyone that lives in the city is free of old age, illness, and death. So that, of course, is a, a more classic, um, again, paradigm where getting out of samsara in the world of Buddhism is freedom from old age, illness, and death. Whereas being in samsara is defined by old age, illness, death, and then rebirth. And then getting old and dying and being reborn again. And so the first way, of course, to understand samsara is that it is the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Now, interestingly, you should know that the word samsara, so the actual word, it's sort of, it's an interesting word. I've been trying to dig deeper into its actual etymology. I mean, I have the basic building blocks of the etymology, but I want to dig deeper into like the Vedas and basically find some older usage of it. But the general idea of what the word samsara means is it means continuous flow. This sort of um, cyclicality, I have heard a translation of samsara being cyclicality, cycling. Um, there's a few different uh, euphemisms or a few different kind of ways of talking about samsara. One of them that I really like, if you ever read the really big Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, one of the things that I love about the Flower Garland Sutra 
is the way that it or what it calls samsara it calls it the mundane world it's such a great it just captures samsara yeah it's about suffering sadness loss decay but there's this sense too that it's just about the mundanity of it and it kind of um like i don't know if you've ever seen it, uh, it, there's a great movie it's an older movie with bill murray groundhog's day and it's this, you know, it's a story about a guy. It's a kind of a, a fantasy film in that way, but it's a guy who keeps waking up and it's the same day over every single day. It's the same day. So he keeps just reliving the same day over and over and over. And that's, in fact, I lived in a monastery a long time ago and the all the monastics got together one Saturday night and they're like, yeah, we're going to watch our favorite movie. And I was thinking, of course, like it's going to be some I don't even know what some really quiet, tranquil, <laughs> like, you know, whatever movie. And they're like, yeah, we're putting on Groundhog's Day. It's Samsara. So I thought that was funny. But anyways, that movie, that idea really captures that idea of Samsara is about this kind of like, again, the cyclicality to it all. And this idea that it's like, oh, here we go again. Oh, got to get another haircut again. Oh, eat again, shave again, bathe again. And it just keeps going around and around and around. And the idea is, is that, you know, many of us are delighted, still very delighted in the mundane world. But there's an idea that at a certain point, or if you just get a little perspective, there's a way in which the mundane world can just get tired and get old, and you may want to transcend that. So that's sort of one, uh, again, I guess, I don't know what you would call it, but the mundane world. There's also another uh, great phrase that captures samsara. And it it's uh, you'll find it in other sutras. They call it the long night of ignorance. And what I love about that name, the long night of ignorance, is, you know, it, if you've uh, been listening to me at all, you know that I I do the Buddhist thing where I use dream analogies a lot. Um, the dream state, the state of being in a dream and thinking it's reality is a amazing place to reflect upon perception, consciousness, all kinds of things. But I'm always using the dream as an analogy because like in a dream, when we're in a dream, but we don't know it's a dream, like we just think it's another day in our life that's ignorance like that's a great example of avidya of what the buddhists call ignorance and it's ignorance because there's something you don't know and what it is is that you're dreaming like in the dream you don't know that that's why you're ignorant but what's interesting about that from a buddhist point of view like from a psychological point of view What's interesting about that is that when you are in the ignorant state of not knowing you're in a dream, you behave in a certain way that then perpetuates the deluded idea that you're in reality. And that cycle of behaving as if it's reality, and so that reinforces the idea that it is indeed in fact reality, and so you behave in a way that reinforces and it just keeps going. <clears throat> great example of cyclicality. Great example of samsara. But what's interesting about that is that you could have a lucid dream. And in the middle of the cycle of the dream, you could break the cycle and realize you're in a dream. And it would completely change 
your disposition to everything you're experiencing. In particular, it would change your relationship to, to desire and to fear. Meaning when we're in a dream, but don't know it, we get afraid of stuff just like normal. Like if somebody came after us, we'd run away. If there was, uh, if we're, if we were having a dream that we were standing on the edge of a building, we would be afraid of falling. So we're fearful because we don't know it's a dream. Or if I saw a big envelope of money in my dream, I would want it. <laughs> I would want it very much. But if I became lucid in my dream and I realized, oh, that's not actually an envelope of money, I can't pay my rent with that, it would cease to be desirable if I were in the lucid state of knowing it was a dream. So notice that you become lucid and you would not be <clears throat> as afraid or afraid at all, and you wouldn't be as desirous or desirous at all. So interesting relationship between ignorance and then fear and desire and then lucidity, or I would call it a kind of waking up. The idea is, is that they call samsara the long night of ignorance. And the point of this long night of ignorance is that it's a lot like a dream in that way that we are afraid and we are desirous. And then whenever we behave out of fear or out of desire, it perpetuates a certain belief about this world that we live in that then keeps us in that mode of pursuing desires and being fearful of things in that way. That just goes around and around, but there are techniques and methods to wake up <laughs> here, like a lucid dream, but I call it lucid living. And it's why they talk about bodhi. They talk about awakening in Buddhism because it's about waking up from the dream, the ignorance of the long night of samsara, the long night of ignorance. So that's a few kind of ways of thinking about samsara. It's either this kind of metaphysical process of birth, death, and rebirth over and over and over again, or it's just the mundane whirl of our lives just sort of this, just going through these kind of Sisyphusian rolling our rock up the hill just to watch the rock roll back down. And then we roll the rock back up and it rolls back down. So just sort of the futility of our efforts in that way. Or it's about this kind of state of being ignorant and then possibly waking up. But the state of being ignorant is the samsaric cycle. All right, so that's samsara. Any questions about samsara? So here we are, trapped in the long night of ignorance or the mundane world. And Kashyapya tells us that, well, it's like we're trapped in that. And there's only one way out. And it's this foot wide, right? It is this foot wide path, this one path. So, and then what doesn't really help us that much is that when Kashyapya defines the one path, what is it? Forget where he, yeah. Oh no, so he, the, we, there's this foot wide path and the only way that he defines it is as, oh yeah, that foot wide path that gets you out of the, the wasteland, it's the one path. Now, what's the one path, right? So there is this phrase called the ekyayana. So I know that you know about yanas, vehicles, because you know about the little vehicle, the Hinayana. You know about the great vehicle, the Mahayana. 
You probably know about the Vajrayana, the Vajra vehicle, and those are called the three vehicles, the Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, the three ways of being Buddhist. But if you get into the literature, you get into the sutras that talk about the three yanas, what you will learn is that there is really only one yana, the ekya yana, the one vehicle. What's the one vehicle, you may ask? Well, <laughs> one way of understanding the ekya yana is that it is the... The idea is, is that if there's the Hinayana, which is this path of solitary individual liberation, primarily through meditation, and then there's the Mahayana, which is the Bodhisattva path, which is liberation through the altruistic vow to liberate all sentient beings. And then there's the Vajrayana, which is, you know, it's basically a path to liberation through expedient means. That's the kind of the general teaching about that. The idea is, is that all three of those, they're really ultimately the same thing. And that's the Ekyayana. That's the one vehicle. But that doesn't really help us out in that way where like we can kind of like, it sounds good, and it's like, okay, cool, but what is actually the one vehicle? So I have to tell you that I was very, very excited. A long, this happened, um, oh, years ago. It was a Dharma Doors, but years ago, and we were reading, it is, it's a Pali Sutta, so it's one of the old school suttas. It is the Satipatthana Sutta the foundations of mindfulness, the sound foundations of sati. And if you know that sutra, you know that there are these four foundations of mindfulness, the body, sensations, mind, and dharmas. And basically it's a, um, it is the way of meditating in Buddhism, or at least the way of starting any meditation, which is first by awareness of the body, and then awareness of senses of the organs, particularly re positive and negative reactions to senses, and then moving to your state of mind, which is arising from the negative positive reactions to your senses of the body. And then from body sensations and states of mind, we can then contemplate dharmas, thoughts themselves, or the teachings of the Buddha. And that process the four-step process of the foundations of mindfulness, if you read that sutra at the very beginning, the Buddha says, this is the ekyayana. This is the one path to enlightenment. These four foundations of mindfulness. And since that discovery, I've had these like numerous uh, textual confirmations that that's the one vehicle. That's what they're talking about. That sort of seemingly simple process of establishing mindfulness using the body first, and then noticing sensations, and then noticing mind states, and then finally realizing dharmas, that's the ekyayana. So that's the one path, that foot-wide one path that leads out of samsara. So... Any questions about that? The one path. Hi, Michael Noe here. Hey, Noe. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because before you got to the one path, I, thank you. I, I love the way you did that. Because when you're speaking earlier about uh, the different samsaras, the recycling, the, the turnings, the, it, 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 at the same time, it seemed really linear to mm. me. It's a linear, my mind is like, but that's yeah. linear. That's that's the idea that there is, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> a future. <laughs> I mean, hmm. yeah, of course, but, you know, but it's like, oh, so, so when you get to this idea of, oh, but it's here, it's here. 
You know, where is birth and death? There is no birth and death. <laughs> if I'm here, where's birth and death? Yeah, so, so I'm so glad you got to the to the one uh, foundations. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I appreciate your comment, Noe, for fi like finishing that thought in that way. As far as that, you said it, Noe, that's the you describe transcending samsara. You, that's it. That's the very idea. In in, in particular. I want, you know, that idea of through the foundations of mindfulness coming into what they call direct presence, total presence in that way. And what Noe noted was the way in which total presence sort of gets us out of the paradigm of birth and death. And that is the very nature of samsara it's what samsara is all about is birth death and rebirth and you know as we talk about you can think about actually i should say this because some of you might not have ever heard this you know in the world of buddhism especially when you get into like hinayana mahayana vajrayana type of thinking there's a few different ways to understand reincarnation in Buddhism. And what I mean is, is that in the Hinayana, I would say, like at the older school form of Buddhism, they were still kind of literally talking about, you know, if you don't play, if you don't do this right, you're going to wind up a, an animal next life. You might wind up as a hell dweller. So in the early form of Buddhism, they were kind of literally talking about lifetimes after lifetimes. And again, kind of a, a certain concern with avoiding lower rebirth, like in a hell realm or as a ghost, right? Now, they weren't playing the karma game of trying to be reborn as a god, because one of the kind of insights of the Buddha is that the gods have it just as bad as the hell dwellers, as <laughs> counterintuitive as that might sound. One of the realizations of the Buddha is like, oh, no, if you go up there, it's ultimately just as disappointing as if you go down there. So you really want to be more in this middle path zone. But nonetheless, early Buddhism was still interested in avoiding certain next lives like you there was an idea of that then you kind of get into a more mahayana buddhism where i would say and i'm i'm generalizing and paraphrasing of course but in the mahayana they lean more towards a very interesting idea which is it's the idea of actually being reborn with every breath. And the idea is, is that with this breath right now, I'm exhibiting the behaviors of a human being. I'm sitting upright. I'm speaking intelligently. I'm listening intelligently. I am a human. <laughs> Exhale. And I just happen, because of the karmic trajectory of all of this, I happen on this next breath. I happen to be being reborn as a human again, speaking again intelligently, sitting upright, listening intelligently. So it just so happens that with each breath, the karmic trajectory of all of this keeps getting reborn as a human. But as I mentioned in other talks, it might happen that with a breath, I'm starting to get overly um like let's say i'm um let's say that there's something that i really want and actually let's say that it's something that i really need it's something that i feel that i need to to take to just you know to feel good or even to feel normal so with this breath i'm starting to get a little desperate because i don't have the thing that i need uh-oh my humanity is slipping. 
And so with this next breath, if it's a little too desperate for something, you could be reborn as a hungry ghost in a breath, depending upon your mindset. And a hungry ghost is somebody that has this, you know, unquenchable desire for different things. Unquenchable in that sense that that no amount of food stuffed in their face satisfies their hunger. No amount of drink satisfies their thirst. And there's a way in which you can get into that mindset of a hungry ghost. And again, it could be with each breath. And so that's the more Mahayana view where they kind of look at it more as kind of these, uh, again, with every breath. This kind of even keeps going to, and I wouldn't say that this is a feature of Vajrayana exactly, because you find this in Mahayana Buddhism and Vajrayana, but it's actually the idea of rebirth with every thought moment. So not even the span of a breath, which can take a few thought moments. It would be with every single flash of thought but with that same idea that at any moment, your flashes of thought could start moving towards a hungry ghost realm or a hell dweller realm or what have you. So, um, so that's a few different ways of thinking about reincarnation or rebirth, but they all center around the idea of the cyclicality of moments of rebirth in that way, either lifetimes or not. And then again, going back to what Noe mentioned, but if you can really sink into this kind of absolute presence where there's basically, and I don't have time to dismantle time right now, <laughs> but the idea is, is that if you could really sink into that present moment where the past and the future are not your your present well the idea is is that birth is in the past and if we're not participating in the past if we're totally present then there's kind of no birth and if i'm not entertaining the future and death is always an abstract idea about something that will happen to me in the future so now, if I can really be totally present, like Noe's talking about, you can kind of transcend that con, the kind of confines of birth and death. And that is one way of understanding liberation from samsara in that way. So, by the way, now this is just occurring to me now. What Noe said that prompted me to say everything that I just said. This is one of the, like, um, how can I say this? There are sutras that talk about this. It's a beautiful aspect of Buddhism. The Buddha talks about how there's these other traditions. In particular, he's always kind of um, going in on the Jains. Like, if you've heard of the Jain tradition, I think they're called the Naganthas. If you ever read the Pali suttas, the Buddha is always sort of talking about the Niganthas. Niganthas are Jains. It's just another name for them. But the Buddha's problem with the Jains, or not his problem, but one of his critiques of that tradition, is that everything that they're promising the practitioner. So if you don't know about Jainism, you know, it's like very vegetarian, very anti violence very kind of it's all about ahimsa and they sometimes go to extreme lengths to avoid killing even microorganisms but what the buddha says is that that tradition though they say that the the payoff the payoff for all of that yeah you'll you'll get it in your next life this, this life, yeah, this is going to be really hard. You're going to be starving most of the time. It's going to be difficult. But in the end, next life, you're set. The Buddha says in, in these beautiful sutras, they're Pali suttas too, by the way. He says, my teachings, what I'm teaching you, 
can be realized right here and right now. This is not about your next life. In fact, there's no you and there is no next life. So the liberation that the Buddha is describing is a liberation that can occur right here, right now by its kind of by its very nature. And again, Noe pointed out sort of the way in which that's the case, the way in which liberation can be attained right here and right now, because it's about transcending that paradigm, the birth and death paradigm of samsara altogether, not accumulating so much merit or good karma that the next life, something happens in that way. So. All right, everybody, I think we've exhausted the parable of the wasteland tonight. Uh, so unless there's any last minute questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Cool. Then... Here, real quick. Hey. Sorry. Thank you. Um, that, it kind of answers the question, too, of, 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 of falling away. You know, if I'm hmm. going to take a vow... You know, I take the vow to be compassionate and 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 to, for all for all sentient beings. That's right now. That's right now. So so yes, I, I didn't feel that that good about it this morning, <laughs> but right now it feels good, and it may pass. But thank you. <laughs> you know, just to be here now with that, I don't. There's nothing to do other than to be here. And that's the compassion. That's the the mm -hmm. the the awakened heart. Nice. The chita. What is it? Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Noe. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. Oh, my pleasure. Appreciate you very much. Do you want to? Do you have anything to say to the group about your upcoming classes, or um, put links in the chat? Yeah, if you throw the link to my website, I do. I finally finalized some dates. I have three classes Yay. coming up. Um, the first is a survey of different Buddhist traditions. It's a class I call the Irreversible Wheel. And uh, that begins on March 25th, and it's an eight-week course on eight different types of Buddhism. So it's kind of like a crash course in all the different types of Buddhism and where they came from, and more importantly, where they exist today and which countries and all of that. Uh, then I have a class on Vajrayana Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism. I'm mainly going to base it on this book called Secret of the Vajra World, and that's an eight-week course on Vajrayana Buddhism that's going to start on April 2nd. And then the last one I'm offering is a sutra study course on this sutra that is usually called the Mother of the Buddhas. This is the longer Pranyaparamita Sutra in 8,000 lines. This is... Um, it's a really awesome sutra that I've been wanting to teach for a while, but I mainly want to teach it because I know that you know the Heart Sutra and the Vajra Sutra, but what you might not know is that the Heart Sutra and the Vajra Sutra are actually summaries of this sutra. So if you haven't read this sutra, you really haven't read the Pranyaparamita Sutra. And so I'm going to teach an eight-week course on this that starts April 6th. And you can find out all that information and read more at my website, lotusunderground.com. And you can register there and all of that or reach out to me for more questions. So that's it for me. Thank you all so much. Gnome.